Okay, so a few disclaimers before I start. This one's potentially going to be a little sassier than usual because it bears repeating, how'd you screw up Keith Lee? And secondly, this booking is going to be pretty simple. A bit obvious in places, not a whole lot of earth-shattering invasion, NXT endgame pomp and circumstance going on. It's just going to be a fairly straightforward list of matches I'd like to see that all make sense because how... Do you screw up Keith Lee? He is history's most perfect man, you stupid f***ing bastard. What do you want from your professional wrestling main eventer? The guy has to be able to talk. Okay, how about a charismatic love child of Barry White in the world's sexiest bear whispering inspirational poetry at you with a kind of eloquent baritone that gives you vibrations in your f***ing bone marrow and can make you feel like the only person in the room at a crowded cocktail party. Do you want unique athleticism? Oh, TakeOver Portland would like to talk to you about that, where Keith Lee and Dominic Dijakovic put on one of the defining pork de soleil hoscrobatic displays of big boys but quick boys, doing things that Beef Sunday shouldn't be able to do. Flips, forward rolls, moonsaults, deadlift power bombs. Keith Lee hurts in every flavor. Do you want someone with a good look? Look at him! F***ing look at him! The only human being to have ever made a beard, no moustache combination look physically thrilling. It's like if the Vitruvian man wasn't such a little bitch. Like sexy Thanos. Like if scientists managed to distill both a tempest and a cuddle into one f***able king. He's so immediately physically impressive that WWE could just drop him into mainstream shows like, oh, I don't know, Survivor Series and The Royal Rumble. And people just knew he was a big deal. Even Brock Lesnar f***ing knew. And he gives as much a about your favorite wrestlers is about Heath Ledger's kids. <sighs> I just, what part of this? This doesn't make sense. What part? I'm, I'm sorry. I, I really am. Uh, look, I'll, I'll calm myself down. And to do that, let's talk about our sponsor for this week, Surfshark VPN. Are you looking for a whole bunch of telly to watch to make you forget about the fact that the universe is an uncaring pit of crabs that sneer at your simple dreams. The new Surfshark VPN. Surfshark provides you with access to servers in over 60 countries worldwide, allowing you to bypass region-locked content, accessing stuff like HBO Max. Hey, do you want to watch Ace Show Succession in the UK, a show about a terrible company that treats its employees like garbage and are run by one family that seem intent on making their entire industry suffer by their refusal to just go away, then use Surfshark VPN and watch till your heart's content. And speaking of big, horrible companies, do you want to browse the internet secure in the knowledge that your browsing history and location data won't be farmed and sold? Want to Google image search Keith Lee without mere yim finding out about it and tracking you down? Then again, you want Surfshark VPN offering end-to-end -end encryption so that you Yes, you can surf the web with total freedom. You can get Surfshark today by heading over to surfshark.deals forward slash jam that jam, entering promo code jam that jam for 83% off and four months for free. That's surfshark.deals forward slash jam that jam, entering promo code jam that jam for 83% off and four months for free. Right, so the story of Keith Lee in WWE, and I promise I'm gonna keep this brief, partially because it's a fresh wound, partially because it's so very sad indeed. After rocking the typical big indies to make a major mark on pro wrestling, your Ring of Honors, your Evolves, your PWGs, Keith Lee arrived in NXT in August 2018, and admittedly, he didn't make a super immediate mark. He was injured fairly soon after his arrival, plus 2018 was the year of Champion Gargano, not many others were getting a look in. However, from mid to late 2009, the rocket under Keith Lee was finally fueled and ready for launch. He pounced Adam Cole into the crowd in the greatest wrestling gif of the year. He was on the winning team at TakeOver War Games, nearly pinned Roman goddamn reigns at Survivor Series, to much acclaim. 
Zayn was the NXT breakout star that year because nearly pinning Roman Reigns at a big four pay per view despite never appearing on the main roster is kind of the definition of a breakout star. He won the North American title from Roderick Strong. He blew Brock Lesnar's white sausage mind at the Rumble. Ooh, big boy. Takeover Portland against Djokovic became the first ever man to hold both North American and NXT championships at the same time. He dropped the strap to Karrion Cross and debuted on the main roster on Raw on August 24th on my birthday, no less. The greatest gift a boy should be able to ask for. And he lost to Randy Orton via DQ after Drew McIntyre interference. The bad things started to happen almost immediately. They took his music away, poor CFO money, and replaced it with some generic loading screen featureless rock. They made him wrestle in a shirt like a husky kid trying to cover himself up at the pool and barely allowed him to talk. He beat Randy Orton clean at payback. And to be fair, the whole company kind of really played that up to be a big deal. So good job there. Then he missed Clash of Champions. Of, of course, why well, you don't want to cap you can't want to capitalize on beating Randy Orton. He was part of one of the weirdest booked male Survivor Series matches in recent memory where Raw beat SmackDown in a clean sweep. But hey, a win's a win, I suppose. He didn't wrestle at TLC, because again, why would you want to capitalize on that? He didn't wrestle at the Royal Rumble, although that last one was because he was isolating after his partner Mia Yim caught COVID. He was booked to wrestle at Elimination Chamber, but then Lee himself actually caught COVID, leading to heart inflammation that sidelined him from action for five months, nearly killed him and restricted him from doing anything more than, in his own words, a light jog. None of that, obviously, is WWE's fault. In fact, WWE took care of him and got him several MRIs, even had him booked for genetic testing at one point. So, like, Fair enough there. Keith Lee finally returned in July, got fed to Bobby Lashley, repackaged as Keith Bearcat Lee, and we can blame WWE for that and for also this singlet and for Keith Lee not being booked as important enough to wrestle on a single pay-per-view since his return. Until the only major thing Keith Lee did since beating Randy Orton at Payback 2020 was almost have Adam Cole as his manager in a near-miss example of how to mismanage two birds with one stone. Keith Lee was then released on November 4th and it was just, I was on holiday when they released him. F me, I guess. Let me have a go. All right, so one thing to address right off the bat, the five months that Keith Lee was sidelined with COVID, I've got a choice here. I can treat it as unavoidable, which will make the booking a bit more of a thing that actually happened in real life, albeit really quite morbid and having it blow a big hole in whatever story I want to tell because I'm not going to book an angle where Keith Lee is written off TV because he caught an infectious disease. There's that approach and then there's just ignore it, which feels odd in its own way, ultimately makes this booking unrealistic and more just straightforward wish fulfillment. And ultimately to me, these bookings aren't really supposed to be completely realistic. They're an exercise in writing short stories, stories that I and hopefully other people would like to see that exist with the benefit of hindsight, conveniently ignoring backstage politics, accidents, the irrational choices of a man in his 70s who doesn't know what cool is anymore and nor does his best friend Bruce. See, the clue is in the name, fantasy booking. Like, I'm, I've never hidden that part of these videos. So I am just gonna ignore the COVID thing. If that makes you feel weird, it makes me feel a little weird too, and no disrespect to Keith Lee, but anyway, there we go. So we're winding the clock back to my birthday, 2020, and the debut on Raw of Keith Lee. And by Keith Lee, I mean, who is he? Who's that champ I see? Rhetorical question, because we all know the answer, Keith Lee. His theme tune from NXT, please, that everyone liked, and his topless tight pants combination, which I very much liked, and also objectively made him look bigger than containing him in a shirt and baggy shorts. Please don't fix what isn't broken. Please feel free now to leave a comment about how I'm a booking genius. It is so easy. Wrestling is so easy, as hopefully you'll see from what's to follow. So instead of interrupting Randy Orton and immediately putting Keith Lee in the middle of a program that is currently bigger than him and guaranteeing that he'll be seen 
as an afterthought on his very first night, you know, as it did with him lying in the ring while Randy and Drew fought on the outside. We start with a Keith Lee match. Because ultimately, that's the biggest string in his bow. He's charismatic. He looks great. He can talk. But top of the tree, the man can go. And demonstrate that with an exhibition squash against Cedric Alexander, who also has Ricochet in his corner. Cedric and Ricochet were teaming up at the time, and Alexander's a magic first opponent for Lee, someone he can throw around, just get to f but also someone fast that you can use to make the visual comparison. Oh, wow, Keith Lee can be as fast as Cedric. Keith wins, takes up the microphone. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Keith Lee. You might remember me from when I came this close to snatching victory for Team NXT at Survivor Series. You might remember me from when I knocked Brock Lesnar flat at the Royal Rumble. Or you might remember me to be the first man to hold the North American and NXT Championships at the same time. And speaking of NXT, when I was wrestling for the black and gold, I beat everyone there was to beat. Johnny Gargano, Adam Cole, Finn Balor, but like shit's passing in the night, I never got to wrestle you. Pointing at Ricochet. You and I, we come from a lot of the same places. We've only wrestled one-on-one -on -one once. That was in WCPW, by the way. And you beat me. That won't stand. So how about it, one and only? How about you and I, one more time, for real, I get my payback and you get to bask in my glory. A payback, give Keith Lee and Ricochet 15 minutes to go. Trust me, from personal experience, it works. Keith Lee snatches Ricochet out the air for a spirit bomb. One, two, three. Keith Lee wins after the bell. Both men shake hands as a sign of mutual respect and in memories of NXT's past. But it's not just said Ricochet being high flyers to showcase Lee's power that makes him ideal first opponent. It's also because both men were embroiled with the hurt business that makes them pivotal into taking Keith Lee and pointing him at his first major feud, Bobby Lashley beef on beef. That really hurt. Hurt Business victimized Cedric and Ricochet on Raw, prompting Keith Lee, who now respects the hell out of both competitors, to come out and make the save, leading to Clash of Champions. Keith Lee versus Bobby Lashley for the United States Championship. Two monstrous cowmen who can move with ramming speed. Two men who just run. <laughs> Why do I keep doing it? Into each other super, super hard. Spear each other through barricades. Lashley runs at Keith, who snatches him and plants him through the announce table. However, at Clash of Champions, Cedric Alexander turns heel, joins the Hurt Business, and costs Keith Lee his shot at Lashley's title. And actually, this way, the Alexander heel turn makes a little bit more sense. Thought we were friends, Ricochet, but as soon as your friend from NXT turns up, you could give a shit about me. I'm going to try my luck with someone who actually knows my worth. Give me a solid gold suit. The Hurt Business injure Ricochet. Bobby Lashley stamps on a chair around his neck, leaving Keith Lee to go up against the entire Hurt Business alone. Him and Lashley have a rematch booked for the next pay-per-view in order to keep out MVP Shelton. Cedric, it's Keith Lee versus Bobby Lashley. Hell and a hell. Hoss wrestlers, Hoss stipulation. Keith Lee is important and should be treated as such. Lee and Lashley are in the cell instead of Roman and Jey Uso because it didn't need to be a cell match that. It was very good, but it was literally also an I quit match, so it can just be an I quit match. Wrestling, it, God, it's really not that hard. At Hell in the Cell, both Keith Lee and Bobby Lashley smash the cell apart, bust one of the cell walls down, getting out of the cell, bust a different wall down, getting back into the cell. Keith Lee just throws Cedric Alexander into the rest of the Hurt Business, counters a spear, popping up Lashley for a spirit bomb. One, two, three. Keith Lee wins the US title. Hot New Star has a few big matches with complimentary opponents and wins a secondary title early on. I know, I'm a booking genius. Maverick thinking, who could have ever thought this was a good idea? Because Keith Lee is US champion, that leads us to Survivor Series and Keith Lee versus Intercontinental Champion Sami Zayn and Hot Christmas. Just imagine if that happened to the takeover. Wouldn't that be a bunch of fucking sprinkles? Also this way, this match is face versus heel. Not heel versus heel, Bobby versus Sammy. And also this way, it's Keith Lee versus Sammy 
fucking Zayn. Wrestling's easy, lad. Keith wins that match, by the way, and after Survivor Series, Keith Lee shifts his focus to, and I cannot believe I'm saying this, Retribution. No, you come back. No, you come back. I have a reason for this, I promise. Carrying on Keith Lee's character work from his debut, this kind of NXT redeemer who comes in and restores people to how good they were on the black and gold, and also this image of him as an unstoppable force who can tear through a faction and battering the big bully piss out of them, he goes after Retribution because he's going on a rescue mission. He interrupts one of their incomprehensible promos and targets first, of course, Mia Yim. Sorry, Reckoning. He tells her, I wanted this, all of this, being here in this ring on this stage, I wanted that for us more than I've wanted anything in my entire life, but not like this. This isn't you, you're, you're not Reckoning. You're Mia Yim, the woman I fell in love with. Please, I don't know what Ali has promised you, but this isn't the way. We'll work it out together. Please, if you just take my hand. Reckoning looks like she's gonna take Keith Lee's hand. And T-Bar stands in the way. Lee turns to T-Bar, and this is very soap opera, and I, I'm enjoying it, I don't know if you are, says, you're not T-Bar. What the hell is a T-Bar? You're one of my closest friends. I'm gonna bring you home the only way I know how, by fighting you and bringing out your very best. The former Dominic Dijakovic rebuffs Lee, saying, the man you knew is dead. All of us got sick and tired of waiting down there, sick and tired of watching chosen ones like you pass us by, just like you've done all my life. I'm sick and tired of not getting the respect I deserve. So I guess you could say, Desperate times called for desperate measures. Lee tries to talk T-Bar around, telling him that the staff rally doesn't care about him. He just wants faceless goons that he can use to push WWE around. Ali is a bitter man with a chip on his shoulder. I mean, look at you, Dominic, because that's your name, Dominic. This is the price you pay for making a name for yourself on the big stage. He hasn't even allowed you your own name. He hasn't allowed you your own face. And Lee just rips the mask from T-Bar, revealing the man, Dominic Dijakovic, underneath. You want to make a name for yourself? Then beat me for this US title at TLC. Retribution swarm Keith Lee, beaten down, and Ali accepts on T-Bar's behalf on the provision that if T-Bar beats Lee, Ali will be crowned US champion. Get a proper cult mentality behind Retribution. Actually give the whole masks and stupid names thing some actual reason for being. So at TLC, get Keith Lee and Dominic Dijakovic to do one of their matches because you know they can. That's one of the reasons you hired both men. You, oh, you guys know how to put together a signature match that everyone loves. Oh, that's cool. We'll build to it, let you do it on the biggest stage we've got in order to make fans happy and make them want to watch more of our shows because, you know, wrestling's f***ing easy for the love of f Lee wrestles T-Bar at TLC. Halfway through the match, rips off his mask again, which makes Dijakovic go Super Saiyan. At one point, the referee goes down, reckoning enters the ring with the US title belt. Looks like she might hit Keith Lee with it, but she can't do it. She drops it, leaves the ring, Lee beats T-Bar, but even in the loss gives him instantly more credibility than he had under the mask. So Dom drops the mask, Reckoning takes off hers, becomes Mia Yim again, and she embraces Lee in the middle of the ring. Teams up with Keith Lee and Dominic Dijakovic to help take down the rest of Retribution. On Raw, Retribution interfere to cost Keith Lee the US Championship against Riddle, leading to the Royal Rumble. Keith Lee, Dominic Dijakovic, and Mia Yim versus Ali, Mace, and Slapjack. The good guys win, and the last members of Retribution turn on Ali, at least having the chance to do so on a main pay per view stage instead of the pre show to. I can't even, fast lane? Was it fast lane? This takes us to Elimination Chamber where there's a few changes. Drew defends the belt against Sheamus one-on-one -on -one instead of inside the chamber. Instead, the Raw Elimination Chamber match is to determine the number one contender to the WWE Championship at WrestleMania. Guess who wins that? Hey, if you guess Keith Lee, you did it. You picked the option that makes the most sense. At WrestleMania 37, you get Keith Lee versus Drew McIntyre for the WWE Championship. Drew goes for the Claymore. Keith Lee snatches him, catches him in midair. Spirit bomb, one, two, three. Keith Lee becomes WWE Champion. But what about Bobby Lashley? 
I hear you cry. Well, The Miz doesn't cash in at Elimination Chamber, so Bobby's not champion yet. Instead, Keith Lee goes on a tear with the belt. He defends it at Backlash against Drew in a rematch, then goes on to Hell in a Cell, where he defends it in a four-way Hell in a Cell match against Drew, Bobby Lashley, and Braun Strowman. Beefy boys, all the rage. Beefy boys in a cage. Instead, it's at Money in the Bank literally the last possible moment that Miz can cash in before he loses the briefcase forever. And then he does it. Lee wrestles Braun Strowman. He beats Braun before Lashley comes down, spears Keith Lee, etc., so that The Miz can cash in. Lashley then beats Miz for the belt, leading to a SummerSlam. Keith Lee versus Bobby Lashley one last time, circling back to Keith Lee's first major feud on the main roster. Lashley won the first match at Clash of Champions. Keith Lee won the second one at the first Hell in the Cell. This one is the decider, and it's won by Lashley. Because yeah, Keith Lee doesn't need to win all the time to be a huge deal. He just has to be treated like one. And literally, that's it. <laughs> That's this video. I know, right? There's, no, there's nothing mind-boggling in here. Just stuff that serves the character, the character's past, big matches, big wins. I just, how do you, how do you screw up Keith Lee? Don't blame COVID. They had months of him not having COVID to, to then they f***ed him up. And you know what? After all of this, I thought doing this booking and just like having a nice little alternate glimpse into the life that Keith Lee could have had if he'd just been treated like Keith Lee, I thought it'd make me feel better. It's just made me feel worse. I can't believe he's gone. God, he's gonna do such great work elsewhere. But anyway, that's subscribe. Thank you. Um, well, bloody hell, hammer. There's a hammer on the wall. Anyway, bye.